It's August 2013 and Counter-Strike is dead. Its newest installment, Global Offensive, has pretty much bombed. It's this janky mess of a game. It released with fog on some of its maps. Apparently someone thought that was a good idea on a competitive shooter. But thankfully, Valve has brought the game back in-house and has a dedicated team of employees trying to fix it. All three of them. But the outlook isn't the best. I mean, how can a shooter like Counter-Strike, which has barely changed since the 1990s, possibly compete with modern games? Well, as it happened, they were about to drop a bombshell on the game, an iconic and massively controversial feature that would transform Counter-Strike and get a lot of people very, very interested in it. This bombshell was called the Arms Steel Update. The Arms Steel added a relatively common feature of multiplayer games to Counter-Strike skins. It was a pretty cool update, or according to certain Redditors, an abomination that went against the very concept of what Counter-Strike is supposed to be. But how much could skins actually change for this game? I mean, they're just video game pixels, right? How much of an impact could they really have? Well, in this video, we're going to be diving in to the history of CS2 skins. 10 years of total degeneracy that's made this game like nothing else out there. Let's get into things. Now, this video is sponsored by Skins Monkey. Check out Skins Monkey to quickly and easily trade your Counter-Strike skins. All you have to do is log in through Steam, add your trade link, and you'll be able to use the site. It takes just seconds to trade the skins you want, and if something isn't tradable yet, it can be reserved for you until it is. You can use the code HEYZUS to get a $5 bonus on your first trade, and this code will also give you a 5% bonus if you purchase balance. And on top of that, the site also has daily giveaways. So it's a great site, check it out, link is in the description. Now, the arms steel update didn't contain heaps. There were eight collections, two cases, a built-in slot machine. You could get up to eight drops a week at the time, but the skins weren't worth anything at that point, so nobody really cared. And pretty much everything else we take for granted wasn't around at that point. No trade-ups, no stickers, no databases. People didn't know what folks or pattern templates were. It was a dark age. So with a small range of ugly skins, low prices, missing features, it was safe to say that CSGO skins were still actually miles better than almost any other game skins out there, and they were an instant hit. This shit was fresh, and CSGO had a really good August, and they were also quick to add more stuff. Firstly, we got name tags, then in September they added the trade-up contract, at the time it sucked, it literally only worked with one case, but within a week, not only had Valve fixed it so it worked with any collection, they'd also released Operation Bravo, adding a whole new case and a new collection. And as Valve were busy filling the game up with new skins, there was already a trading community starting to form. People hadn't figured out what folks and patterns were yet, but they had figured out you could use the blue spot on the end of your shit tier case harden to try and convince people it was worth overpay. And two other iconic uses for skins were also rapidly developing gambling and scamming. On the gambling side, the Dota 2 betting site Dota 2 Lounge had launched its CSGO spin-off, CSGO Lounge. And on the scamming side, all sorts of stupid kids were rapidly finding ways to lose their knives to the dumbest of tricks. Luckily, Steam support was there to help and would often restore the lost items, but they didn't always get it quite right. Famously, one agent fucked up the scam Karambit they were restoring, resulting in the creation of the glitched No Star Crambert. Not that its owner had any idea how special it was though. In fact, on the 30th of October, he actually sold it on the Steam market for less than a normal Crambert was going for at the time. If only the poor guy knew. Anyway, November started off pretty lame with the incredibly boring Weapon Case 2, but it would get more interesting towards the end of the month. Firstly, they have decided to release six whole new collections, which replace the existing weapon collections that dropped in game. And having binned the OG collections after just four months, these new collections would never be replaced, ever. They're, they're still being dropped 10 years later. Secondly, since Dreamhack Winter 2013 was happening, the first ever Counter-Strike Major, Valve decided to release a special souvenir package that would drop to viewers of the event. And the souvenir package skins had a brand new feature to make them unique, the sticker. Now, these stickers had a big problem. They were shit. They looked bad, they had random sizes and orientations and were also randomly scratched, but it was a concept and that concept 
would eventually go places. And then to round the year out, Valve would give players two new cases, including the first ever community case, the Winter Offensive case. And this case was a big fucking deal because every skin in it was designed by members of the community, not by Valve. And every time the case got opened, these members of the community would get paid for it. This system was absolutely brilliant. Valve got to outsource skin creation to people who could do a much better job than them, the community got better skins, and the artists got to make fucking bank. It was a huge success, and this would lead to talented artists submitting countless numbers of amazing skins to the Steam Workshop in the hopes of being in a future case. And combine that with an absolutely amazing December when it came to the player base, Counter-Strike was ending the year in an amazing spot. And 2014 was set up to be even better. 2014 started slow. Valve actually went for an entire month without catastrophically breaking the game. Naturally though, this couldn't last, and in February, Valve managed to completely ruin CSGO with some changes to the org called the Orgpocalypse, turning the rifle into an overpowered game-destroying piece of shit. Thankfully, Valve did patch this out after a week, but not before org prices had skyrocketed. But this wasn't the only way Valve had just broken CSGO, because at the same time, Valve also released the CZ, a pistol that completely screwed the competitive meta, and this weapon wouldn't be fixed for an entire year. But hey, it, it did come with a case, one of the worst cases ever released. The one bright spot in all this is that we did get a new operation, and the case that came with it added two of the most iconic skins ever to the game. And February had one other addition, the first ever sticker capsule. Unlike the Dreampack 2013 stickers, these are stickers as we know them today, even if they were really lame and no one cared about them. The second capsule that released a few weeks later was a bit more popular, at least it had the crown foil, but this was all just a trial run for the bombshell that was coming in March, and this bombshell was the Cannabisa 2014 team stickers. These stickers were available in the in-game store for the duration of the tournament, and half the money spent on them would go to the orgs in the capsule. It was a brilliant scheme with just one small problem, and this problem was the community thought these stickers were shit. The sales were frankly minuscule, many buyers forgot they had the stickers or just randomly stuck them on their blue laminates, and famously, the whole event was so forgettable that the only record we have of the sticker sale is this video Lorders accidentally recorded. No, Lorders, this is your chance! No, Lorders, you can make a fortune! Lorders, no! Anyway, I'm sure these stickers won't end up becoming massively important later on or anything. Now, they have made people wait two months for some new skins, that must have been agonizing, but the wait paid off when Val brought out the Huntsman case, containing a brand new knife, the game's first ever penis themed skin, oh, and also a snazzy new M4A4 made by a talented young artist called Ozzy. Now, this was a real redemption story. Ozzy was an Ozzy, previously best known in the Ozzy scene for being racist in community servers, but this breakthrough skin, which had apparently been drawn based on his own dog, was a major achievement for this upstanding young individual, and I'm definitely not sarcastically foreshadowing anything right now. May was also a pretty good month for updates, there was a new collection added to the drop pool, trade-up contracts were changed so you could mix collections in a single trade-up contract, they all fucked this up by the way and added an honestly really cool bug that will come up later. And they have also removed a feature most people probably didn't realise was ever a thing, skin deletion. Yes, once upon a time, you could delete your knife if you wanted to. These days, people will say it was removed because some dum-dums deleted their karambits, but this feature was really ripe for misuse by bad actors, and I'm not surprised Valve canned it. Anyway, June 2014 began with a bombshell revelation. It turned out the artwork on the how was actually someone else's pooch, and that someone else was not very happy about it and filed a DMCA. Valve intervened quickly, removing the howl from the Huntsman case and replacing it with this piece of shit skin, and they also gave existing howls a new look and the special status of contraband. This naturally led to the howl becoming very expensive very quickly, and to this day, it is the most iconic and valuable M4 skin in the game. But while all this was happening, another landmark event was quietly unfolding in the background. Actually, maybe quietly is the wrong word here. Basically, a young Swedish man by the name of Luda recorded himself yelling at the computer screen while he opened cases and stuck the footage of it on YouTube. 
This concept, which believe it or not was actually a novel and unique idea at the time, turned out to be insanely popular and literally invented an entire genre of content that not only exists to this very day, but countless other content creators would jump onto. Everyone from the Phase guys to Max Mofo to fucking Moist Critical. What's up everybody, it's Critical. I'm gonna be doing the biggest case opening in CSGO history. Now, the second part of the year was also pretty action packed. Firstly, Valve fucked with people's inventories by reducing the inventory size limit from 2,400 to just 1,000 probably because it was causing in-game lag. And because storage units weren't a thing at this point, this made investing in cheap items an absolute nightmare. So a lot of people just didn't do it. July also started with Operation Breakout. This had a lot of cool skins, although the only ones that really matter are the Dragon Lore from the Cobblestone Collection and the Butterfly Knife. And this was followed by another case literally just nine days later. And then heading into August, it was major time. Now, there's not much to say about cologne stickers other than that Valve invented pickums to encourage people to actually buy them, and they put effort into the trophy too. Imagine something like this these days. But the real changes came to souvenir packages. Basically, Valve would change them so each map had its own unique package. And because Valve had shoehorned a broken, busted, and unbalanced cobblestone into the game and literally forced teams to play on it using a map randomizer, this meant that souvenir dragon laws were now a possibility, if you could get one. And no one even knew what the odds were. The result was a skin that was basically mythical. A couple were definitely unboxed from this major, but they'd basically be a kind of CSGO urban legend for over a year. Anyway, with the Cologne major over, an exhausted and demoralized US team called Arbor Power decided to take advantage of CSGO Lounge and throw a meaningless online match for a few Orb Asimovs. Lounge was rapidly turning into a nightmare for pro players at the time. It turned out the bettors really like to DDoS the teams they're betting against. So the other power guys figured, why not take advantage of this shit show? I mean, what were Valve gonna do? Ban them? Now, come September, Valve moved the CZ to the 5.7 slot rather than the P250 slot. This didn't nerf it by that much, although it was a slight improvement, but the main result was P250 prices went up a lot because now the gun was actually usable again. October also saw some interesting developments. Firstly, we got music kits. That's all the attention I'm giving them this entire video, by the way. And secondly, Valve introduced community sticker collections, which were available in-game in the form of these limited time offers. Now, the reason we care about them isn't because they're good stickers. They're not. Sorry, Warrior, but they, they suck. It's because after two to three months, Valve would quietly retire these collections from the store and their prices would start going up a, a lot. So they turned out to be insanely profitable sleeper investments. What, what could possibly go wrong? Now, November saw a new operation which was best known for having a really bad case. It also brought back all the same operation collections from Operation Breakout. There was another major with these really ugly block stickers and also literally missing team stickers from this one for some reason, go figure. But following tradition, December had some real spice because another artist just got caught fucking stealing their work. Now, this guy wasn't as brain dead as Ozzy was about it, like it wasn't as obvious, and they didn't post some retarded spiel about how it was based on their pet budgie or something like that, but they still got caught, and a lot of people expected the skin to become contraband, and its price skyrocketed. However, it turned out Valve didn't want to reward copyright theft by making the relevant skin super valuable and highly desired. So they proceeded to simply change the artwork instead, which proceeded to fuck over everyone who panic bought the items. Still, it was a good year for skins and people were starting to notice just how expensive things were getting. One player who had apparently decided he needed absolutely everything in the game finished 2014 by selling his entire collection for over $7,500. $7,500 on video game items. Can you believe it? It was so incredible, there were media articles on it. And it didn't look like things were gonna stop in 2015 either. 2015, in fact, would actually bring some revolutionary changes, amazing changes, but also the literal worst parts of this entire scene. Let's get into it. 2015 began with the launch of a website called OP Skins. OP Skins was a landmark development for the scene. It was the first major marketplace that allowed players to buy and sell their skins for cash. 
Players were already doing this of course, but OP skins meant that for the first time, there was a safe and reliable ecosystem to do it in. Skins were turning into real commodities, and trading was getting more sophisticated too. Guides were starting to pop up detailing all the best patterns on skins like Blue Gems, terms like the Scar Pattern were starting to be more commonly used. And in the meantime, Valve would release some of the most legendary knives ever added to the game, the Chroma Knives, which included famous finishes like the Sapphire, which really stood out and looked completely different to any other knife. And the first databases were also being created. In February, CSGO Exchange launched, allowing people to track skins for the first time ever. And the same month, we got the Katowice 2015 stickers. These stickers look good and they weren't on sale for very long, which led to them becoming a kind of B-tier Kato 2014, which in this scene is definitely a compliment. March didn't see any new skins, but it did see other big changes. Firstly, Valve updated the trade-up contract to work with stat track skins. This smashed the price of good stat track skins and dramatically increased the price of bad ones, which did fuck over a lot of people, but it was still a good change. And while they were at it, they also halved the number of drops you could get each week in game. Four drops a week was still a lot and most cases were just three cents, aside from some outliers like the Bravo case, but this was the start of a long-term trend that would eventually lead to massive carnage. April saw the Chroma 2 case released, one of the most popular cases in CSGO history, and it also saw a 15-year-old Californian called Trevor Heitman release a video on the 10 most valuable CSGO skins under the moniker McSkillet. He may have gotten literally everything in the video wrong, but it went viral anyway, and Trevor quickly capitalized on his success and built himself a big following. May saw the release of Operation Bloodhound, which bought a new case and three new Operation collections, including the first ever weave skin, a momentous moment for the game. June saw the formula for determining the wear value of a skin made in a trade-up contract leaked to the public. Some people had already known about this for a while, and they'd been using it to print money from trade-ups, and they'll fucking piss their secret was out. But for everyone else, this discovery was a huge W. Cologne 2015 added a new type of sticker, the autograph. They also decided to put their stickers on Dorito chips for some reason, so nobody liked them at all. And September saw yet another massively unpopular release, the Shadow Daggers. Not only did they make you feel massively stupid for walking around with a set of butt plugs in your hand, they also literally shook the screen when you took them out. And at the same time, Valve also nerfed the M4A1S, crashing its price and causing an instant spike in demand for the M4A4. This was just the first of many back and forth between the two weapons, but at the time, it felt like a major shaker. And in the meantime, people were really starting to notice just how expensive Counter-Strike skins were getting. People like this young lad from North Carolina who called himself Mr. Beast, who released a video talking about how crazy it was that Karambas were selling for $200. Pretty nuts, right? Anyway, Jimmy is an excellent segue here because increasingly, it was becoming apparent that skins were not harmless and this poor young man would be corrupted. Do you remember that anomaly video from 2014? Well, by this point, our autistic Swedish friend had built a huge career from it. And a lot of people had a look at this fat Swedish guy bringing in views by the millions and decided they wanted some of that action. One of the early participants was Max Mofo, who quickly succumbed to the hobby and uploaded a bunch of very popular Gamba content, but he was soon followed by a bunch of grifters who weren't addicted to cases, but to clout, and saw some easy views by jumping on this trend. And by late 2015, this was popping on YouTube, and it began to intersect with another trend in the scene. Because people had also figured out that you could just use CSGO skins to make your own fucking casino. This stuff was going on very, very early, all the way back in 2014. I don't have the exact dates, but it was always there. And while it was low profile at first, with CSGO booming and OP skins growing rapidly, they quickly started getting a lot more attention. Not to mention getting thousands and thousands of kids hooked on gambling. And one of those kids, was Jimmy. Now, we don't actually care that much that Jimmy's entire future was probably ruined by his addiction. What we actually care about is the massive org who gave thousands of kids life-ruining addictions so they could afford a CSGO team. And that org is called FaZe. The FaZe guys opened some cases here and there doing the whole anomaly but way less entertaining thing everyone else was doing, but 
behind the scenes they wanted a CS team, the only problem was they couldn't afford it. So to solve this issue they decided to set up a gambling site and get their 12 year old fans to lose on it. This whole episode was notorious not just for the fact that fans lied about owning the site but also because they released some of the most transparently fraudulent advertising in the entire history of the game to remote it. I lost but I just- He lost? But he got money. All before boasting about what they'd gotten away with years later. But hey, it worked, and a few months later, they had their team. And in their defense, they were really just the tip of an iceberg of scumbaggery that was accumulating beneath the surface of the skin scene. And players had much more pressing things to worry about in the meantime anyway. Like the fact that in December, Valve completely ruined the game with the Revolver update. Now, aside from adding the most reviled gun in the entire history of the game, it also added a case that nobody liked at the time, plus some random revolver skins, one of which accidentally got added to the older souvenir packages, creating a legitimate glitch skin that shouldn't exist. But anyway, soon afterwards the weapon was fixed and it was all sunshine and rainbows for Christmas. All in all, 2015 ended on a high for CSGO. But although people didn't realize it at the time, unfortunately, the honeymoon was about to be over. 2016 started with people being blown away by just how expensive skins were getting. One veteran trader, Milk, even made a video declaring he was getting out of trading because of how stupid it was getting. And to be fair, there were a few big collectors out there like HFB really pushing prices to stupid places. But as Milk also pointed out, could you trust Valve not to ruin skins long term? After all, they could destroy it all with a single update. Anyway, January started off with Valve making a massive quality of life improvement by adding buy orders to every skin on the Steam market. And in February, we got a new operation, Wildfire, an operation of mostly recycled content, which is gonna be a bit of a theme from here. March saw Valve put some real effort into fixing a problem, account security. Basically, they forced people to start using their mobile authenticator app, which had a bunch of security features built into it. Now, this app wouldn't stop you from getting scammed if you were a complete retard, but it did greatly increase just how retarded you needed to be. And in return, Valve declared that Steam support would no longer be restoring scammed items, which was a really important development because people had been exploiting this feature to duplicate skins. It was a huge problem that presented a huge risk to the market and Valve fixed it. March also saw the MLG Columbus stickers released. This introduced the Splice Foil, which people were very certain was definitely going to be the next I Buy Power Hollow. And then April brought the Chroma 3 case. This thing had horrible skins and was way less popular than the previous Chroma case. But two months later in June, Valve was back with something far more interesting, the Gamma case. Valve actually held a sci-fi skin design competition for this container, but its real legacy were the Gamma Knives themselves, absolute bangers that are classics to this very day. And speaking of banger knives, while all this was happening, the most banger knife in CSGO history was about to sell. This was the factory new Cranbit 387. And during June, legendary CSGO lounge better new rage would take a break from doxing traders he didn't like to purchase this thing for roughly 100,000 US dollars. This was the most expensive trade ever by a mile. Milk's warnings in January had clearly fallen on deaf ears and all of this might lead you to believe that things were going well for skins. After all, we're getting sick releases, records are being set, it sounds like an absolute party. But the truth is, things were starting to go seriously wrong. And it was because of those gambling sites. Now, the gambling scene was absolutely booming. Some streamers, like the extremely popular and 100% authentic Twitch personality Phantom Lord, were pulling tens of thousands of viewers by degening on these sites. And you can tell by the comments that the audience fucking loved it. But that love was about to be destroyed as the fraud began to be exposed for what it actually was. It all started when the OG Counter-Strike player Mo accidentally added himself for cheating during his sponsored gambling streams when he got into a fight with said sponsor on social media. This was not a smart move and it blew up in his face, although it was still just a minor scandal. The next scandal though was not minor. Call of Duty scumbags, Team Martin and Syndicate 
got caught pretending to be sponsored by a site they actually owned, leading to them being fucking cooked by people like h 3 h 3 and Moist Critical. And to wrap it all up, that Phantom Lord guy I mentioned earlier got caught secretly owning a site and rigging it as well. This was a very not good look, and in response, Valve sent out a cease and desist to every single gambling site they could possibly find before engaging in a massive campaign to ban the bots of these sites. Some sites like OP Skins did escape the chaos, but this, combined with a sharp drop in the game's player base, caused hysteria. And by the end of July, skin prices were crashing. It was a dark, dark month. People had been woken up to the fact that their game was mortal and Valve could destroy skins if they wanted to. But Valve liked money and that wasn't what they wanted. And after about two months of doom and gloom, people started coming back to their senses and the market began to pick up. Although Valve had killed off some of the big sites, including CSGO Lounge itself, they hadn't actually killed off gambling. It wouldn't be the same again, but it definitely hadn't been killed off. And people stopped being terrified of Valve, mostly because they were too busy being angry at them instead. August saw us get the Gamma 2 case. This was basically a slightly worse Gamma case and didn't get that much attention, but October saw something much more controversial, graffitis. Now, the graffitis themselves are completely forgettable. They're not bad, just boring. But people were outraged because in older versions of Counter-Strike, custom graffitis have been a completely free feature. Now, shockingly, Valve didn't want people flooding the game with their custom porn graffitis, and they weren't really actually charging that much for graffitis either. I mean, they dropped for free. But Redditors needed to be angry, and graffitis were the new enemy of the week. Now, November saw Valve do something genuinely a bit more shitty. All those sticker collections that they were releasing and then quietly discontinuing on the in-game store, Valve brought them all back all of them in unlimited numbers. A lot of these stickers had gotten extremely expensive and the people who invested in them got fucked in one of the most spectacular crashes in Counter-Strike history. The same month, Valve also added gloves and believe it or not, these things were controversial. Partly because they were as rare as knives, but also because they had wear values. I, I know, wear values, just like every other skin in the game. How evil. I guess gloves didn't need to be extremely rare special items, but they are and everyone is used to it now. But at the time, people truly were molding about it. And the glove case wasn't that popular. It took quite a while for gloves to take off. But despite Redditors frothing at the mouth at Valve's evil updates, by the end of 2016, things were looking up. The market had recovered, plane numbers had recovered, and we looked set for a fantastic 2017. And shockingly, we got it. 2017 kicked off with a banging major, E-League Atlanta, which featured some unusually good looking stickers. The following month, McSkillet released a video detailing how that bug in the trade-up contract I mentioned back in 2014 worked. This was not a new discovery, I'd known about it for about six months by this point, but it was a very powerful exploit and now it was out there to the public. In March, Valve released the Spectrum case. This was a very popular case with some very nice skins and some very, very nice knives. And over the next couple of years, its existence would massively inflate the value of butterfly knives. A nice butterfly went from being $200 to being more like $2,000. During April, Valve increased the maximum balance your Steam wallet could hold from $400 to $2,000. This was a huge improvement, the old limit was utterly terrible. In May, Operation Hydra was released. Now, this operation was mostly recycled content, but it did block its drops behind these really annoying co-op missions against bots. And because the missions sucked so much, it meant this operation didn't produce that many cases or skin drops. Two months later, in July, PGL Krakow rolled around, introducing gold autographs for the first time. These were pretty well received too, and while all this was happening, gambling sites were continuing to chug along, producing massive profits and continuing to get huge numbers of kids hooked on the gamba. Now, Valve was constantly trying to combat them by banning their bot accounts with generally pretty limited success. However, during July, there would be a very unexpected casualty of this war, and this casualty was a site called IGXE. IGXE was the Chinese version of OB Skins, a truly massive marketplace, and Valve banned all of its bots completely without any warning or explanation. 
Now, this lost a ton of people a ton of money. IGX staff apparently tried to meet Valve in person to beg to get unbanned or something like that, but it was no use. The bot stayed banned and users lost millions in the process. And this led to a ton of conspiracy theories because at the time, Valve was only a couple of months away from an official launch of CSGO in China and people started accusing Valve of basically trying to take out competition in the region so any new player signing up to the official client would use the Steam market instead. Although the truth is that the fucking morons just put a gambling mechanic on their site. In the meantime, we also saw a slowdown in the skin economy. Prices and volumes dropped, although it did kind of just seem to be a seasonal thing. Now, in September, the official Chinese release of CSGO finally happened. This didn't change much, like people in China were already using the game, but it did force Valve to officially release the odds of cases. And to absolutely no one's surprise, it turned out the odds were really, really shit. They also released the Spectrum 2 case, which wasn't as good as the first Spectrum case, although it wasn't terrible either. During November, something interesting happened though. Operation Hydra ended, and to everyone's surprise, the Hydra case was discontinued with it. This was probably because the operations drop system meant that not many of these cases actually got dropped and Valve always canned the least popular active case. But given its rarity and the fact that it had banger skins, its price skyrocketed, which was really unusual at the time since most cases were only three cents. And speaking of prices skyrocketing, well, with the year heading into December, prices across the entire market started picking up. I was selling on OPCNs at the time, and it was a lucrative fucking month. In addition, despite Valve's best efforts, the whole gambling site thing was still producing rivers of gold and new sites were still popping up everywhere. Just ask Mac Skillet. That year, he launched two of them. So, all in all, it was a great year for the game. People were optimistic, the play base was stable, the market was steady, the gamba was powering on, and it seemed like 2018 could only get better. But the truth is, old Counter-Strike was about to die, and things would never be the same again. 2018 kicked off with the E-League Boston Major. This major stickers were a disaster for Valve since two of the teams dropped out of the event after the stickers were released, leading to some short-lived market hysteria around the discontinued stickers. But the event itself was a banger, largely because of the crazy way Cloud9 managed to win it. At the time, the Manma for Skadoodle was so intense that a Russian gambling site owner actually paid $60,000 for a souvenir Skadoodle Dragon Law, a purchase so famous that it even got featured on Adult Swim. And as he reviewed the record-breaking viewer numbers at the Boston Major, Three Clicks Filler would prophetically declare, The game's doing well. Let's be happy for a moment. Before spending the remaining 80% of his video trying to come up with ways to argue that the outlook was actually bad it couldn't have been more on point. February itself was pretty good. The Clutch Case introduced the Vice Gloves, an absolute classic to this very day. Prices and playing numbers were hovering around record highs, but the happiness wouldn't last. Because at the end of March, Valve would fuck everybody. Adjustments to map and trade. This notorious update would destroy trading as people knew it, send the game into a tailspin, and basically serve as a kind of mass extinction event for the game skin community. Now, all this update did was add a seven day cooldown whenever you traded a skin, which may not sound like a big deal, but the entire ecosystem was built around being able to trade stuff instantly. So this just obliterated everything. And I mean obliterated. Most participants in the market saw something like 90% of their profits disappear overnight. Valve claimed this was to combat frauds and scams, but most people interpreted that to mean gambling sites. And unsurprisingly, this was followed up by a massive ban wave against the bots being used by the entire gambling system. Millions upon millions of dollars of skins were lost, including the $60,000 Skadoodle Dragon Lord that was bought just a few months earlier. Nice. People also realized that McSkillet was trade banned too and actually had been for quite a while. A couple of months earlier, he'd been hit when his phone number was used on one of the bots on his gambling site. Not that it mattered to him, he had $10 million in crypto and decided to move on to a Fortnite project. But in the meantime, the entire community was apoplectic. Trading as they knew it had just been fucking destroyed. The market absolutely tanked. Play numbers also tanked, and it really did start to seem a bit like the end times. A lot of people quit, never to return. But of all the people fuming at what Valve had just done to them, the angriest of all was OP Skins. 
OP skins have been the cash out vector for the entire gambling ecosystem and this update had cost them an ungodly amount of blood money and they did not take the situation lying down. Now, initially their reaction was just to release propaganda blog pieces, pouting about what Valve had done, straight up lying about how big the impact on play numbers actually was and stuff like that. Reddit would praise them for their objectivity, but Valve were unmoved, making it clear that they were fine with the outcome and wouldn't be changing shit no matter how many signatures that petition got. But OP Skins had another trick up their sleeve, something called Express Trade. This was an internal trading system for skins on their bots that gambling sites could interface with, which in theory would let them resurrect the entire industry. It might have worked, except Valve proceeded to immediately step in and ban all of OP Skins bots, killing it all right there and then. OP Skins would throw one final Hail Mary by inventing their own knockoff crypto based VGO skins which couldn't be used in game in the hope that gambling addicts wouldn't care and just keep up the gamber but this didn't work so they exited the space to focus on the VRL grift instead. But the truth is, OP Skins had just thrown away a fortune because CSGO was not dead, not even close. Amidst all the destruction, things were getting back on track. The same month OP Skins was banned, Valve would announce the Panorama UI, a very badly needed overhaul to CSGO's UI that made the game not look like it was from 2005 anymore. A user called Frank Furter also pulled off a pretty impressive feat. He crafted a Dragon Lord with a 0. .00001337426 float, a skin with such a low float that it's basically impossible for another Dragon Lord to ever beat it. In August, Donald Trump would send the Turkish currency into a tailspin by saying some mean words on Twitter. This suddenly meant that keys which you could purchase in Turkish Lira were 30% cheaper for Turkish players and these players quickly started dumping them on the market for a profit. Valve would quickly fix this, but this was the start of an increasingly annoying problem for them with exchange rates. We also got a new case that month, which wasn't very good and I'm not going to talk about. In September, Valve added two new collections of skins for the London 2018 Major. These were initially just meant to be souvenirs, but they were soon added to the main drop pool as well. In October, Valve would slash the price of the Org and the SG to try and get people to use them more in game. This didn't really change anything yet, but ultimately this would have a big effect. And in December, Valve dropped their biggest bombshell yet, the free to play update. Plus Danger Zone, plus the Danger Zone case. This update saw playing numbers absolutely skyrocket. The market also picked up as well. And one other little December tidbit. A Chinese collector called QKSS got a couple of million dollars of skins vac banned, including some really rare and one of a kind stuff. Nice bro. It's not super super important, but I couldn't leave this little bit out. In any case though, despite all the chaos of 2018, 2019 was suddenly looking really good. There was a very real sense that this game had a future, a bright one. And with the old CSGO truly behind us, there would be no going back. Now, 2019 is a pretty important year because it's the year that the Chinese scene really took over the skins market. There's no one clear moment when it happened. It was a gradual process, but to briefly explain it, over the course of the year, a Chinese site called Buff163 would come to overwhelmingly dominate the market. This was driven by two things, the growth of CSGO in China and the fact that these Chinese players had fuckloads of money. It also saw the gradual development of a new type of trading which would come to be known as cash trading. This was basically a glorified instant cash out service which suddenly had quite a lot of utility in a market that was a lot more annoying and illiquid than it had been in the past. To this day, these two things define the skins market. Buff163 is the biggest marketplace and most traders are cash traders. Now, after such a huge end to 2018, the game was quiet on the update front for a few months. In March, the Katowice 2019 Major rolled around. This Major ruined souvenirs by turning them into an unlimited purchasable commodity and it also let me make multiple videos about penises and also saw the ore get a shit ton of use. So much so that Valve actually decided to increase its price about a week and a half after the event ended, which caused the price of its skins to abruptly plummet. March also saw the Prisma case released, one of the best cases released in quite a while, and April had its own interesting development. Namely, a casino run by an Indian tribe in Washington sued Valve to literally try and shut down CSGO skins 
and sees all the money ever made by Bow from skins existing. As you might have noticed, skins are still a thing, so they weren't very successful. And while all this was happening, prices across the entire market and Cato 2014 skins in particular were steadily going up. In July, one trader called Onapixel, who was sort of this niche Twitter personality, Yo guys, what's going on? It's Onapixel here. Decided to take advantage of the strong market and sell off his Times 4 Mac 10 Reason Holocraft for $3,300. There were a few warnings he regretted, but he generally wasn't too bothered. I mean, it's just a skin, right? It's not like people are going to remind you about it for years and years afterwards. And at the same time all this was happening, the SG553 was rapidly catching on in the competitive meta, causing the prices of its limited range of skins to absolutely skyrocket. In August, there was another exchange rate kerfuffle, this time involving the Argentinian currency imploding. Again, key prices crashed on the market as Argentinians enthusiastically bought and resold them. And the following month, severely pissed off with this exchange rate problem, Valve would update the game to make keys tradable, tacitly blaming money laundering for the problem even though it was obvious they were just sick of this exchange rate bullshit. Oh, and the same month, the CS20 case was released, a unique golden case celebrating Counter-Strike's 20th birthday. And it also marked the biggest gap ever between case releases, 219 days. Now, this gap had definitely been accompanied by a lot of whinging. People weren't happy about the lack of updates, even though overall the game was doing pretty good. But heading into November, it quickly became apparent why there'd been no updates. Valve had been cooking. Firstly, they released the storage unit, which allowed people to keep up to 100,000 items in their inventory, an extremely useful tool that we'll get onto later. Secondly, and much more importantly, Valve released the first operation in over two years, Operation Shattered Web. This release was fucking massive. There was a new case, insane new collections, agent skins, co-op missions, and a new drop system. Now, there was a small problem with the agents being invisible for a bit. Oh, he didn't see me! He didn't see me! This would get fixed, but it wasn't great. And at the same time, they have also increased the price of the SG553 back to $3,000. A lot of people were asking for this change because this weapon had basically rendered the AK obsolete. People suddenly realized it was better all along. But as the skin prices show, it quickly turned out this nerf was not enough to end this weapon's domination of the competitive meta. Anyway, in general, Counter-Strike was ending the year in an amazing place. Famous stickers like the Titan Hollow had gone from roughly $4,000 to about $10,000. Skins like the Dragon Lord had gone from about $2,000 to about $4,000. The player count was going up, prices were going up, this shit was hype. And in 2020, the game was heading into a brave new world. A world that would be driven by China, and driven by it in more ways than one. The start of 2020 was quiet. Valve didn't do a whole lot. But the rest of the world was not quiet. Instead, a highly infectious flu variant had exploded in the city of Wuhan and then spread across the rest of the world, forcing everyone to stay inside. And because masturbating stops being fun after a while, a lot of people started playing a lot more CS. Fun memories, am I right guys? It also got major shit canned indefinitely, we'll get back to that next year. Skin prices went up as well, although again, that is nothing compared to what's coming next year. And it was only in April that things really kicked off. Firstly, Valve massively cucked the SG553, crashing its price and ejecting it from the competitive meta. They also added the Prisma case, pretty cool case, and the Shattered Web case, unexpectedly got discontinued at the end of the operation. And even though this had happened during the last operation as well, it still caught people off guard and the price of the case went up a lot. Or at least it went up a lot until Valve released the Fracture case. This case contained all the same knives and the first print stream skin and was an instant hit, completely fucking over everyone who'd invested in Shadow Web cases. But here's the thing, the Fracture case released in August, and basically nothing had happened in the meantime. And I don't mean by that the community was dead or anything, in fact it was bigger than ever. There were plenty of minor community events like Valve deleting the inventory of the gambling bot that some YouTuber was publicly given by CSGO Empire, stuff like that. But on the Valve front, nothing was happening, and this was going to be a theme from here on out. The game might have been bigger than ever, but 
where was Valve? What the hell were they up to? Anyway, in November, HFB, that legendary collector I mentioned earlier, accidentally made his inventory public and it all got registered on Float.db. Within hours, I was on stream exploiting the situation by cataloging everything with Zipple and Onapixel, and this annoyed HFB. Not because I made a video, but because the database hadn't actually registered everything, so Zipple had underestimated his inventory's value. So he went out of his way to unprivate his inventory again and got everything else added. And in December, after a very long and drawn out wait, we finally got another operation, Broken Fang. Broken Fang was basically a copy of Shattered Web that was worse in every conceivable way. Aside from arriving late, its co-op mission was much shorter, the operation skins were abominable though if it shit, and it was clear that a lot less resources had been put into it. But the community appreciated it, and although 2020 was a wretched, miserable year for humanity, it was a great year for Counter-Strike and for skin prices. An M9 Tiger II, for example, had gone from $400 to $550, and a Field Tested Fire Serpent had gone from $400 to $600. But this was nothing compared to the madness that was about to come in 2021. The world might have finally been starting to get back to normal, but the game would never be the same again. 2021 also started slowly. Valve did release some stickers to raise money for the major they never had in 2020, including for teams like 100 Thieves who'd just cut their CS team and never came back. And because these stickers were released in a different format to previous majors, a lot of people, including me, assumed they'd never go on sale. And some of them even invested big money into the stickers. This ultimately proved to be a financially suboptimal move though, as Valve slapped a 75% discount on the stickers in April, ruining a ton of people and also literally breaking the Steam market as people tripped over themselves buying, opening and selling the 25 cent sticker capsules. It was so bad, Valve had to release a statement. May produce a snakebite case, it's shit, let's move on, and in June, things actually started happening. Firstly, Valve released an update that prevented non-prime accounts from getting in-game drops. There were tons of non-prime accounts doing case farming at the time and a bunch of other bad things this update was trying to stop, so Valve came in and fucking nuked the entire thing. You can see just how many bot accounts were wrecked by this just by looking at the play numbers that month, and if you ignore the negative 20 IQ takes by the media about this being a bad sign for CSGO, this would have big consequences for the market because suddenly there were a lot less cases being dropped. But those consequences wouldn't come yet because something much bigger was happening. You see, June 2021 was the high watermark for dumbfuck stupidity on the skins market, perfectly symbolized by a notorious trader called Luna who stumbled into the space and dropped a ridiculous record-breaking sum on Titan Hollows, which had pinked at over $50,000 following several years of hysteria. He also started buying all sorts of other random skins that made no sense, probably believing that CS players were a bunch of dumbasses that he could leave holding the bag, and Luna's lunacy was just a symptom of the broader brain rot that had infected the scene. Getting good price graphs for this period can be a bit challenging, I'm having to use my old videos from the time, but basically, over the space of three months, high-end skins doubled in price. Why this happened is still unknown, but what's not unknown is that this was unsustainable and caused a catastrophic crash that the market would spend well over a year recovering from. Not that any serious player on the market was actually worried. An obvious bubble may have burst, but in the long run, that was probably a good thing. Except for Luna, anyway. He lost hundreds of thousands of dollars and stormed out of the scene looking like an idiot. Anyway, 2021 was a pretty interesting year. In August, a $750,000 US dollar trade may or may not have happened in China for a souvenir dragon or in a stat track minimal wear 661. If this trade wasn't a hoax, it would be the biggest transaction to ever happen in the history of skins. And there was almost an even bigger one. In September, New Brage, owner of the $100,000 Crambit Blue Gem, blew off a 1.2 million euro offer someone made for it via Honor Pixel. This may seem insane, but New Brage did not need the money and the offer may not have been genuine anyway. And in September, we got Operation Riptide. Now, unlike previous operations, which had been a copy and paste job, this operation was a rushed copy and paste job. It released with a ton of bugs, it didn't have story missions, it did have good skins, so that's the plus, but just like with Broken Fang, it really seemed like Valve weren't putting in the effort. I mean, what the fuck were they doing in that office? How hard is it to copy and paste an operation? Anyway, in November, with the pandemic mostly over, we finally had another major. 
this time at Stockholm. It was a good event. Its stickers were really, really nice, although Valve, in their infinite laziness, forgot to get player signatures in time for the Major, which was a problem for the souvenirs given they're meant to have signatures. Instead, they were replaced by these map stickers, which completely robbed souvenirs of any identity whatsoever and left them as soulless husks of their former selves. Like, what the hell, Valve? How hard is it to get fucking signatures done on time? Anyway, the year would end with a streamer called PSP Wanji manipulating the price of the orange Wanji graffiti for shits and giggles and getting a bunch of people temporarily banned, Chad Move, and all in all, 2021 had been another great year for the game. Sure, prices hadn't moved much because of all the turbulence and because COVID was over and the bots had been nuked, playing numbers were down, but the community was upbeat and there was a sense that things were in a good place. And surely, Valve had some amazing stuff planned for 2022, right? 2022 kicked off with a hotly anticipated release, the Dreams and Nightmares case. This case was meant to feature the best skins selected from a competition hotly contested by the workshop's most talented artists. But when the case finally dropped, it turned out Valve had somehow managed to only include skins that looked like shit. Or at least, that's what people said at the time. Today, it's the most popular case in the game, so who fucking knows? The following month, February, the Chinese collector QKSS had his new account, which also had over a million dollars of skins in it, banned as well, and then deleted. It It wasn't clear what he'd done exactly, but it was impressive that he managed to lose all of his skins. Twice. By March, Stockholm stickers, which had started off pretty flat as investments were picking up steam, many of them more than tripled in value over the space of a couple of months, but this boom was short-lived when Valve decided they liked Stockholm stickers so much they were going to release them again for Antwerp. This stopped the Stockholm stickers in their tracks, and Antwerp stickers were heavily overbought, or at least that's what it seemed like at the time. Either way, they were pretty dead for the rest of the year. In June, HFB, that collector who leaked his inventory, got hacked. The entire community watched on in horror as the hackers emptied his inventory in plain sight. But Valve stunned everybody when they actually stepped in to return all the stolen skins and even admitted it was their fault. And it gradually became apparent afterwards that a lot of people were being hacked, including QKSS. That's what actually happened to him. Although after HFB, it seems like Valve actually did something to stop it. In August, the huge trading site Seize Money got hacked as well. This was a different type of hack that was completely unrelated to what happened to HFB, but the hackers still stole millions in skins and also sent out tons of stuff to traders to try and confuse the situation and cover their tracks. Not that it worked. The idiots behind this hack actually made their accounts absurdly easy to spot and Valve had banned them all within a couple of days. Oh, and to celebrate CSGO's 10th birthday, Valve gave us a sticker capsule. It's a cool capsule, don't get me wrong, but most people were still pretty underwhelmed. But in fairness, Valve was probably busy with the new operations, so we had to cut them a bit of slack. In October, Valve released stickers for the Rio Major. Unlike Antwerp, they didn't copy Stockholm this time. These ones are sort of new, but they were also not very well received and people didn't get that excited about them. But what did get people excited that month was Onopixel's attempt to open a Titan Hollow. Legend has it that that moment is hanging on the walls of Valve's offices to this very day. Anyway, heading into November, there was a lot of excitement about the next operation. People were really keen to see what the next set of knives was going to look like. I made about 35 videos hyping up these things and saying they were just around the corner. And on the 18th of October, the end of year update finally dropped. It had four lines of text. This was a big update in some respects. Anubis was an exciting change to the competitive map pool, and the changes to weapon balance were a pretty big deal. It even affected the price of orbs for a little bit, but there was no new content, no new operation. In fact, it was clear the operation was not coming. So what the fuck was Valve doing in that office? When the fuck were the updates? Where had the content gone? It was clear something wasn't right. But what was it? Despite the lack of new stuff, 2022 ended well. Player numbers were up, prices were up, one guy sold an AK for over $400,000 in December, a record for an individual skin at the time. It was a good time for Counter-Strike Global Offensive, which was a very big contrast to 2023, because 2023 was going to be the end of it. It began on Twitter. Slowly, leak after leak. 
Rumours about Source 2 had existed for a long time, since like 2017, but in 2022, bit by bit, actual discoveries had been happening. And by the start of 2023, it was clear it was actually coming. It wasn't vaporware and people were getting hyped. Player numbers were up, skin prices were up, the community was buzzing and it seemed like things couldn't be better. Now, a few things were still happening. In February, the final CSGO case ever released, the Revolution case. This case reused the clutch gloves from 2018, an obvious sign that Valve was saving new goals for Source 2. It also featured a blatant copyright violation that forced Valve to change one of their skins for something else. And at the same time this was happening, a small trading site called CSGO XO got hacked and lost 700k skins. Just like with CS Money, Valve intervened and returned the skins, but unlike CS Money, the owner shut down the site afterwards and doesn't seem to have compensated users. So in other words, he turned a hack into an exit scam. However, it was in March that things really got cooking because after years of waiting, Valve finally announced CS2 and the game looked amazing. In a very literal sense, like the skins in it looked really good. They were bright, they were shiny, a bit too shiny to be honest, and as stupid and superficial as that sounds, this had massive consequences because it made the price of skins skyrocket. Now, to be clear, obviously, CS2 was more than just a visual overhaul that made your Doppler knife blind you. It was a complete rebuild with a ton of promised features that got the community incredibly hyped. But this, combined with the fact you could run a solar plant on the glow from your Karambit Sapphire, got people spending in a crazy way. Prices were nearly at record highs when the announcement happened. 18 months of steady increases had basically reversed the crash of 2021. But when CS2 was announced, prices went from record highs to fucking looking like this. They went up, then they went up some more, then they went up some more after that. It also caused case unboxing rates to go up 150% compared to the start of the year. And this combined with the decreases to drop rates that I mentioned years and years ago, led to the community basically running out of cases. So their prices started looking like this too. And you know those dead major stickers I mentioned from Antwerp and Stockholm? They skyrocketed in price as well. This one literally caused mental breakdowns in some members of the community. So suddenly, skins were at a brand new all-time high. The community was completely euphoric and it was all but inevitable. Something would go wrong. And it was actually quite a few things. In April, Valve dropped the Anubis package in preparation for the upcoming Paris Major. These were pretty cool skins, but otherwise unremarkable. But what was less cool is what Valve did at the Paris Major, which was to give the community the Stockholm Stickers 3.0. Well, to be real, these stickers were pretty, pretty good, but they were so good the community spent $110 million on them, apparently thinking that the Antwerp and Stockholm Mega Stonks were going to happen again. Spoiler alert, they didn't. Paris stickers bombed as investments and brought down the Antwerp and Stockholm stickers with them. Although, on the bright side, the money was really good for the pro scene. In June, Valve changed the way that cases dropped to be a reliable once a week occurrence. This nuked a lot of case farmers for a bit anyway, although it didn't matter heaps since unboxings were coming down anyway. But by this point, it was becoming clear that the skins hype that ceased to have kicked off had been a bit premature. The price of everything was falling again, and by the end of July, many skins had lost the majority of the increased CS2 had gotten them. And in the meantime, the girls were fighting. And by girls, I mean gambling sites. Basically, the owner of one dodgy gambling site targeted another dodgy gambling site for being a dodgy gambling site, resulting in a bunch of extremely embarrassing drama and getting a whole bunch of people trading on that gambling site trade banned, although ultimately nothing really ended up happening. And then in September, CS2 finally came out. Was the wait worth it? Well, the community didn't think so. CS2 released patently unfinished. Many features that had been present in CSGO were missing. There were some serious rough edges to the gameplay. Some of the promised features like Back Live didn't seem to be there at all. And the most hype gaming release of 2023 was met with widespread disappointment by the players, many of whom quit. YouTubers opportunistically jumped in to pan the game, not that I'm in a position to criticize, and the skins market tanked. A year? that had started so promisingly was ending in disaster. It's March, 2024. Where are we now exactly? 
After months of constant updates, Seize 2 is in a much better place. One particular massive open wound remains, but the game has improved. After a very long drought, we finally got some more skins updates, the Kilowatt case which brought the Kukri knife, Zeus skins, and also your grandma's china to Counter-Strike, and also a sticker update that brought a whole new way to be socially inappropriate to the game. There's even been a new number one skin discovered. It turned out that a stat track factory new scar pattern existed all along and just belonged to some rich guy who didn't care and couldn't be bothered to show it. Play numbers are up, prices are up, case openings are up, sapphires are still ruined, and there's even whispers of an operation after the major. Is the nightmare over? Maybe. Time will tell. But one thing is for sure, I don't think this story ends anytime soon. And with that, this video is finally done. If you've enjoyed it, please like, comment and subscribe, massively appreciated. Otherwise, trust the numbers, not your guts. I'm Jesus, thanks for watching, see ya.